renewable energy, which is cheaper than um, fossil fuel. Um, yeah, um, other thing that we've heard here at the conference, it's uh, all the initiatives. Um, we've had a quick assessment on that and um, the, the sector emissions, uh, sector initiatives, and we found that well, it is really good that countries um, are part of these uh, initiatives, that a lot of the potential that are uh, within those initiatives are already covered by their pledges and by their policies. So we should also be careful there. Um, yeah. And well, the main, um, the last message is um, we, we go from having um, really good outlook at the most optimistic scenario that Nicholas presented. We have the pledges and targets scenario, but the one that it's at the highest, so with the highest temperature, is the one with the policies, and that's where we're currently headed. So uh, besides the targets, uh, countries should really put at home uh, in, in a, uh, sufficient policies to back all their plans and all their targets. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Maria. Okay, I will open the floor to questions. If you could just state your name and organization as well in the back there, sir. Yes. Joydeep Gupta, Joydeep Gupta from the Third Pole and the Climate Change Media Partnership. So yesterday we had this investigative article in the Washington Post which showed that the many countries are under-reporting their emissions and you are uh, uh, taking those emissions that the countries are reporting at face value. So if those countries are under-reporting their emissions, what is the value of all your calculations? Uh, thanks for that question. I think the, the issue of yeah, calculating how much emissions countries have is a long-standing issue. Um, uh, there's ups and downs. There are certain uncertainties there. There has been this report uh, that there has significantly under-reporting. Uh, under what we are doing is we are actually not taking the country's emissions as face value. Uh, we always complement them with all uh, other estimates that are out there, and we decide, well, make an expert judgment which numbers we trust most. And that's quite a lot of work, and that's very unfortunate. We don't have a very good database for all of this, and I think the community could probably do better. But what we do is we curate the data and we use the best we can get. Um, well, that is not error-free, but it's as, <clears throat> is as good as we can get. So I would think what we are doing is quite reliable on uh, what you have. We test whether the total emissions that we get are uh, consistent with all other estimates that are out there. Thank you. Next question, and you'll have to help me. The lights are strong up here, so if I'm missing hands, please wave them vigorously. No, up in the front. Microphone, wait a yes. second. Yes. Jayashree from the Hindustan Times. Uh, I wanted to know, right now we are on track for 2.7 degree warming. Uh, if you don't consider the net zero targets, is that what you said? If you could just clarify on that. Um, I'll start off and then uh, anyone else can join. Um, the the 2.7 estimate is for our current policies. So that's basically the actions that are on the ground in countries at the moment. Um, so obviously that's, that's the highest level of estimate. And then if you say, okay, well, what happens if they take the targets that they've currently put on the table? That then gets us to 2.4 degrees, and then if you add in, in addition to just, the, that's the 2030 targets, if you then add in targets, the long-term targets that we consider to be binding, so those are either the net zero targets that have been passed in domestic law or that have been submitted to the UNFCCC in enough detail in the long-term strategies that countries are submitting, um, that gets us to 2.1. And then if you broaden the scope and consider all of the net zero targets, also beyond countries that the CAT, the CAT uh, only normally tracks about uh, 40 countries globally um, that represent around 80% of emissions. But if you broaden that scope and look at all countries that have announced in some way or that are considering discussing net zero targets, then that's when you get us the, get to the best estimate, which is the 1.8. So. Next question. Yes, woman in the back. Hi, um, I'm a graduate student from the Yale School of the Environment and also working at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. Um, I was just wondering in what way do you account for business actors within the emissions that you talked about? Because um, 
when like when you're looking at net zero for uh, political policies, it's like it is obviously just political policies. So how do you consider industry action within um, the your sort of uh, sort of modeling framework? Um, yeah, Nicholas. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks. So what we are really doing is looking at uh, government policies uh, that are in there, and the whole idea is that, well, there's an ambition loop between uh, business actions, cities, regions actions, and national actions. So if the businesses are more ambitious or the cities are more ambitious, that at one point governments are equally more ambitious and then they uh, uh, help each other to do more. Um, we have, in a different uh, uh, project, we have estimated the impact of businesses as well. It's a little bit in addition, so it wouldn't change the picture significantly if you would uh, take all of their actions into account as well. But th you have a point here. We, uh, the gap is so huge, it cannot be solved by government action alone. You need this ambition loop between all of these different actors. That is very positive, but again, uh, be careful. There's a lot of announcements and also there, uh, not all announcements are really implemented, and that's why you need to be careful on, on those actors as well. Great. Next question. Anyone? Oh, in the back. Thank you, Thank you very much. Andy Wilch here from the Met Office. Um, my question is, uh, come 2030, how big is the emissions gap, given your latest assessments? Um, in megatons, the emissions gap would be 45 to 49 um, gigatons. Whereas uh, if you wanted to follow the median estimate for a 1.5 degree pathway, it would be 26 gigatons. So that gives you a gap of 19 to 23. Um, sorry, yes. All right. If there are no other questions, then maybe... Oh. Yes, Masako, please. Thank you, Masako Konishi, WWF Japan. I wanted to ask that UNEP gap report, I heard that they are doing 66% probability. And this one, from what I heard, is 50-50. So when you do the same probability analytics, do you come to the kind of a similar conclusion, all three um, research organizations is doing this, and I was wondering how it is consistent. It's a great question. Exactly. So there's a, a, um, different ways to say what temperature level we uh, reach. Uh, we always use a 50-50 chance of reaching a certain temperature level. Others, like the UNEP Emissions Gap Report, uh, uses a 66% chance to be below a certain level, and that's usually a higher level then. If you compare like with like, we are very, very close. Um, um, by a matter of 0 0.1 degree um, if you compare the right scenarios with each other. So it's, uh, well, it's also no coincidence because the Climate Action Tracker is one of the main inputs to the UNEP Emissions Gap Report. Uh, that gap report actually is updated as we speak. Right now there's another event. And they come up with exactly very, very similar temperature estimates. Uh, also, I can say there has been this estimate of the IEA uh, for all the net zero targets. They also use a 50-50 chance. So if you compare them as well on the right basis, you get the same thing. So if you want to be, we, our estimates that you see here are always on a 50-50 chance and the 66 percentile uh, uh, numbers are a little bit higher, but they're totally consistent. Nicholas. And if you want further detail, in the briefing paper, which is available on our website in the fourth annex, we have a detailed listing that compares our assessment to the UNFCCC uh, synthesis report and the UNEP gap so that you can see the temperatures there. So thanks very much. I think there was a question over here. Yes. Uh, may I ask whether these results are coming from all countries or only the major emissions? Because in the Climate Action Tracker website, I don't see the results of Oh, I mean the assessment of all countries, only certain countries. Thank you. Yeah, if I may. So at the Climate Action Tracker, we follow in-depth analysis for 40 countries, but the global emissions take also emissions from, from the rest of the world. We just don't do them sort of bottom up, but we take um, scenarios for, for that. Um. And also estimate their NDCs of the uh, countries that we are not covering in detail. So we also integrate the NDCs that all the other countries have put forward. Yeah, correct. Any other questions? 
If not, then I will give the, oh. Yeah. I will give the uh, panelists uh, just a couple of moments to wrap up and uh, maybe starting with Bill, if you're ready. Yeah, great, thanks, Claire. Look, I guess one of the critical issues now um, looking to the final days of the COP is just how uh, parties are gonna increase the ambition. And it's quite clear that um, the emissions gap that's huge is not gonna be closed in the next few days. So. Uh, I think the focus needs to be in the last days of the COP on uh, coming out of Glasgow with a very heavy and serious process uh, for next year where countries are, are invited very strongly to bring back sufficient action uh, to really close this emission gap significantly. As my colleagues have said, the biggest issues out there now in some ways are, are the absence of serious action on the coal phase out that's needed and also on gas. Gas is the fastest growing source of CO2 emissions the last five or 10 years. Um, if you look at the International Energy Agency projections, it's one of the fastest growing sources over the next decade. So uh, it's really incumbent now on countries to really address those challenges. And politically, we need this COP to agree very time-bound process in 2022 to come back, uh, possibly at leaders' level next year, to really nail uh, this one and a half degree limit and to close the gap. Great, thanks very much, Bill. Maria? Yes, thank you, Claire. Well, I would re reiterate that besides all the really good um, intentions, uh, putting the targets and the initiatives and the pledges that countries must back them up at home and do policy that it's necessary to achieve those targets. Great. Nicholas? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, just to reiterate, if, if with all the policies that are currently implemented, we are, our temperature estimate is 2.7 degrees, and if we use the 66 percentile, uh, it's only a 66 percent chance that we are below 2.9 degrees. So that is catastrophic climate change. It's a situation that we simply can't handle. Um, with the currently implemented policies. And there's a huge gap towards what countries uh, uh, put forward. And our low number of uh, uh, 1.8 degrees is nice to have, but currently we are really not on a pathway towards it. And this huge gap that we have in 2030 is so huge that it's not enough to do a little bit here and there. It's not enough to do a little a methane initiative or to uh, some initiative on coal or some initiative on transport, all of these elements are good, but not enough. They move the needle a little bit lower, if at all, uh, but what's really necessary is a, is a complete uh, different way of looking at it and uh, that all countries go back. I uh, recommend you to look at the Climate Action Tracker website because we have a lot of information there for you, for all of the 40 countries that we analyze, latest policy developments, how, uh, how much uh, they are doing, uh, what they could do better. We have a very detailed analysis now on their net zero targets, whether they are of high quality or not, and what they could do better to define their net zero targets, so that's new. We also look into climate finance, on how much climate finance they provide and whether that's fair and enough. So uh, there's a lot to explore on uh, climateactiontracker.org. Over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Nicholas. I was actually going to say that my colleagues have uh, impressed enough upon you the sense of urgency, so I was going to remind people to, to visit the website, but Nicholas beat me to it. Um, so yes, the briefing paper is now up, and all of the data associated with the emissions gap and the warming projections is available there. So I would encourage you, if you have any um, further questions or interest, to check out the website, and if you um, would like to contact us with other questions, just please send them to our press at uh, climateactiontracker.org email. And that's great. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day.
Leave it with you, mate. 